ladies and gentlemen, we're back for yet another review, and to follow up my hour and 40 minute Snake Eater review, we're reviewing the very next Metal Gear game, not Metal Gear Solid 4, but Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops, released for the PlayStation Portable in the year 2006 with a brand new game engine based on Snake Eater subsistence. Usually when starting the gameplay portions of the previous videos, I often ask myself, where do I begin? However, that sums up this entire review really well. I had put a ton of work into the previous videos, however, those are all games that have been covered in detail at this point. However, nobody really has ever said anything particularly meaningful about Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops. Ever since Metal Gear 1, I've always tried to look at these games and try to say something new. Look up reviews of Metal Gear 1, and most of them will say, blah blah blah, start of the series, but it's too cryptic, blah blah blah, hasn't aged very well. Yeah, I get it. With Metal Gear 2, it's just taken as law that, yup, the game makes so many improvements to the controls and so much better, blah blah blah, the game has so much in common with MGS1. MGS1 reused these ideas because Metal Gear 2 didn't come out into the blah 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 blah. I had said many of these things as well, but I had noticed a lot of pacing and level design issues in Metal Gear 2, so I wanted to show why it is that both of the MSX games are on pretty even playing field for me. I thought that the Twin Snakes was on par with the original. Some things were better and some things were worse. I thought MGS2 was superior to both the original and the remake in terms of design and story and I wanted to show why. I agreed with the majority on MGS3, so I decided to dive into it, saying every last thing I could say about it. I'm not saying I'm better than anyone else, what I am saying is that I've always tried to see it from a different perspective, as opposed to just saying what's been said and done a million times. Like I said, Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops has barely been talked about on YouTube, and I find that to be a shame. Today, I'm going to be defending the criminally underappreciated Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops. What do I mean by underappreciated? After all, the game got fairly good reviews, but that doesn't represent the game's legacy in the series and the fandom. When Portable Ops was in development, the game was considered the next entry in the saga, the sequel to Snake Eater. Kojima himself described it as necessary to completing the story of Metal Gear Solid 4. However, nowadays, people question whether or not Portable Ops is even canon for reasons to be explored in this video. So needless to say, the game has been more or less written off since it wasn't remastered for the HD collection, wasn't put on the Legacy collection, and is basically never mentioned after MGS4. Now, am I going to say this game is perfect? Of course not. Portable Ops is a flawed game, and like I alluded to in the last video, it is a downhill point after the masterpiece that was Snake Eater, but I think it deserves more credit than it gets. So just to give the usual warning, this video will spoil Metal Gears 1 through Solid 3 and Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops, as well as light spoilers for the next few games to follow it. To begin with some of the more technical details, I want to talk about how I played Portable Ops for this review. Like I said, the game was released on the PSP in 2006, and with it came a whopping 20 frames per second and a fully controlled camera on a console that does not have a second analog stick. The developers decided to have the camera be controlled with a D-pad, but you can change that to the face buttons if you really wanted to. My first exposure to Portable Ops was back in July of 2016, the year I'd gotten into the series. I had played and beaten Metal Gear Solids 1 through 4, Ground Zeroes, and Metal Gear 1. I wanted to give Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops a shot since I'd never really seen someone dive deep into the story and gameplay presented here. So I picked it up for the PlayStation Vita and it took me a bit but I did get through it and thankfully the Vita has a second analog stick and you can just map the D-pad to set analog stick and that was how I controlled the camera. I doubt playing on a legit PSP really changes that many things though because you can always snap the camera back behind Snake with the L button like in the 3D Zelda games so that's not a big deal. I figured I'd be using my PS TV to record the footage for Portable Blobs but for whatever reason for the longest time this was one of the games on the blacklist that you can't play which is a category that a majority of the Vita library falls into. It was eventually updated to work with that hardware but sometimes it would work for me and sometimes not so through some interesting methods I got to work and now I can play all the blacklisted games. But when surfing the interwebs, I discovered that fans have released a hack for Portable Ops that allows you to play the game at 60 frames per second on an emulator. I knew this was going to be the way I was reviewing the game, and here we are. I also decked out the Xbox 360 controller with what I thought would be the most comfortable settings. However, I'll explain what those were in the gameplay portion. The patch is only in its beta stages though. The gameplay works fine for the most part, however, when running in 60 frames, these pre-rendered cutscenes will have none of it. By that, I mean they run faster than normal, meaning that the audio sounds like it came from an SA2 cutscene. Or safe at the rehab you defeated me. I had no so So when playing, I switched 60 FPS on and off since I knew when the cutscenes are about to happen. Hence why, until the patch is completed, I recommend playing Portable Ops with a default frame rate on your first run. Why do all this as opposed to playing the game on the PSP? Well, this game is often compared to the sequel, Peace Walker, which was also released for the PSP. But that game was released in the HD collection and therefore was updated with console quality controls and 60 FPS. Initially, the game had you control the camera with the face buttons as was also 20 FPS. I just felt to put Portable Ops at an obvious disadvantage when comparing it to the console Peace Walker. If the developers are not going to give us Portable Ops at its full console potential, I'm just going to have to make that experience myself. 
Anyway, like I've said, this was a handheld game released on the PSP, but this was not the first handheld Metal Gear game. It started with Metal Gear Ghost Babel for the Game Boy Color, and to capitalize on the success of MGS1, the game was called Metal Gear Solid in America. I've never played it personally, but it looks like a fine 2D Metal Gear game. I was going to do an editorial on it, but I can save that for a later date. We also saw the Metal Gear Acid series, which was PSP exclusive as well, but the gameplay of those looks dreadfully boring, so I've never played that either. Portable Ops was the first attempt at a canon handheld Metal Gear game, so we'll be looking at this game and see how it handles this. Initially, I was going to spend some time talking about Portable Ops Plus, seeing as I've talked about Integral, Substance, and Subsistence in the previous three videos. However, this doesn't actually come with the main campaign of Portable Ops. Portable Ops Plus mainly exists to play online with a shoehorned in campaign where you're meant to grow your ranks and have more soldiers to play as in the multiplayer. You can even defy all logic and use as many characters from previous Metal Gear games that your mind can conjure up. And by that I mean Campbell Raiden from MGS2, Johnny the Prison Guard from MGS3, which might actually be the first time I mentioned him, and given the plot of MGS4, better late than never. We also get Old Snake from the then upcoming MGS4 as a matter of fact. I don't have much else to say on this one since the online is down so I can't play it. But before I say anything else, can we please stop to admire just how amazing this artwork is? Snake Eater had a similar one, but this is vastly superior in my opinion. It looks like a classic film poster from that era with detailed and accurate characters with nearly every frame filled with an interesting detail or relevant image from the game. It just sets this game up as an epic journey. So with that said, let's start the review with the story. Six years after Naked Snake had successfully destroyed the Shagohod, killed Colonel Vulgan and assassinated the boss, and 25 years before Solid Snake is sent in to rescue Grey Fox and destroy Metal Gear, the year is 1970. With Snake, also codenamed Big Boss, finding himself in a jail cell as a member of Fox arrives to interrogate him. This is Lieutenant Cunningham, and he holds nothing back when torturing Snake for info. The info he's looking for is the location of the Philosopher's Legacy. If you remember, at the end of MGS3, Eva took the legacy that Snake had got from the boss and gave it to China, however that was a fake. Ocelot took half the real legacy and returned it to the CIA with the whereabouts of the other half being unknown. This is what Cunningham wishes to know, and he believes Snake is the only one who would really know. Anywho, Snake busts out and meets up with... Roy Campbell. Well, nothing really says that Big Boss and Campbell didn't know each other, this was just never mentioned before. Although, given how this game ends, it does make sense that he would be at a high rank in Fox Sound during MGS1 and MG2. Campbell knows of Big Boss since he's become an icon since Operation Snake Eater. Evidently, Snake had retired from Fox immediately following his being given the title of Big Boss. Now, Fox has gone rogue and have taken over a Soviet missile base that was abandoned during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The members of Fox, led by a renegade named Gene, had killed off Campbell's unit and locked him up. The two have now set out to stop Gene's nuclear rebellion, since evidently the CIA thinks that Snake is responsible, which makes no sense seeing as he retired from Fox, but still, he now needs to prove his innocence by stopping Gene and Fox. And to do it, they're going to need to recruit some of Gene's men to their side, thus setting up the events of Portable Ops, also known as the San Geronimo Incident, since that's where the game takes place. This game doesn't really have the same setup as MGS 2 and 3, so we don't really have an intro chapter to talk about. Portable Ops is just one story from beginning to end. But hey, you can input your name at the beginning, and longtime subscribers will love the one I picked, so how about those characters? Last time I started this segment with talking about the radio cast, but Portable Ops doesn't really have much to say in this regard. We talked to Campbell, who's the task giver like he always is. He helps Snake run the private army and send spy units out for you. Campbell's a likable character in Portable Ops, and the actor does a good job portraying a younger Campbell, but nothing about him is really interesting. Other than that, we talk to Ghost, who tells us about the new Metal Gear. Snake tries to contact Major Zero at the beginning, but ends up talking to Paramedic and Sigan, who set up the mission, although we don't get to talk to them much since it only can be done via the communications tower. By the way, this is probably the least interesting codec of all time. There is not much subtlety here, nor are there many Easter eggs to speak of. We just see two PNGs having a brief conversation, and that's all there is in regards to animation here. So how is Snake in this? game. To begin with, this game has the least amount of cutscenes in the Metal Gear series since Metal Gear 1, with about an hour and a half of these fully voiced animated cutscenes. So needless to say, this story doesn't leave as much to say as MGS1 through MGS3. How about what we did get though? Well, I think this is a logical continuation of what we saw in Snake Eater. Last time I talked about how Snake had gone from a patriotic soldier to a betrayed and broken man that would eventually become the big boss of Zanzibar Land. This game offers quite a bit of insight on the transition. One of the most interesting lines at the beginning of the game that I had completely forgotten about was when Paramedic tells Snake that he is believed to be responsible for this incident despite that being impossible. The reason is because of his legendary reputation. Snake says, looks like I've been done in by my own overblown reputation yet again. 
I found this so interesting since it actually ties back to what I had said about Naked Snake in my MGS1 review. Although I had thought that the reputation had begun after Portal Blobs and before Peace Walker, but he's already been overhyped before this game even took place, which is a great detail that we'll have a point made out of it in MGS4. Snake seems much wiser this time around. Despite being hesitant at the idea of being a commander, Big Boss still captures the hearts of his soldiers not only through his words, since he's very well spoken in the scene where they recruit Johnny, but his actions speak just as loud as Big Boss puts his life on the line yet again to stop Gene from destroying their land with nuclear weapons. Since the story is that Gene is trying to make his own nation where soldiers don't have to live by politics, a nation called Army's Heaven. He's gonna use the nuclear weapons left behind to destroy the Soviets since they left their soldiers here to die and he's using that to gain the support of said soldiers. Similar to MGS3, I have more to say about Snake come the ending, but I'll get to that in a bit. Elisa is the female that helps Snake out in this game, and she's a member of Gene's army that helps with the detaining of the Perfect Soldier Project. Her sister Ursula works directly with Jean on the field. These two sisters have ESP technology, with the governments of the world looking to use their abilities to their own advantage. Jean has taken them in and is still technically using their powers for his own benefit, but he still gives them more agency than the other governments, I suppose. She wants to help Snake since Jean has gotten his hands on Metal Gear Raja, the completed version of Granin's Metal Gear project. She doesn't believe in the use of nukes and Snake is a way to stop him. She does help out when needed, like the part where she rescues Snake and company from being killed after they bust Snake out of jail, so that's all fine and good. But her character lacks complexity since that's about as far as it goes. But when Snake corners Jean, he reveals that Elisa and Ursula are actually one and the same. It's a matter of split personality. I believe this was caused by Jean, but I forget. Ursula being more powerful than Elisa, so that's the side that Jean prefers to work with. This twist did actually catch me by surprise, however it wasn't entirely out of left field seeing as Ursula never spoke when she was on screen and never shared any screen time with Elisa, however it doesn't really blow your mind. What do I mean by that? Well, spoilers for Leighton Brothers Mystery Room coming right now, so skip to this point in the video to avoid it. In that game, Alfendi Leighton has two personalities. We're introduced to his good, mild-mannered side as we work with him throughout the game. Occasionally, he'll transform into a much more psychotic and obsessed version with far more personality and a non-existent filter. These two sides being the Leighton Brothers, with the same logic used for Elisa and Ursula being sisters. By the end of the game, the twist that changed everything was that the good side of Al was truly the fake one. The one we had grown to love was merely an illusion, and the psycho we always ignored as being a bad habit was the real deal man. Nothing that complicated or mind-blowing was done in Portal Blobs, and I believe that was a missed opportunity. Ursula pilots Metal Gear Raja, and Snake destroys that model, however, Gene reveals that this was a prototype, and he has the real Metal Gear for this game. This leads to an amazing scene, where Gene's army and Snake's army are all in one place, as Gene demonstrates his power over the minds of these men by convincing them all that there's a traitor amongst them, inspiring them to shoot each other until nobody's left alive. One of my men is standing amongst you right now. His instructions are to kill you for your betrayal. He's lying! Don't listen to him! <sighs> He's gonna kill us! He's going to kill us! Hey, get a hold of yourself! Snap out of it! Your enemy is standing right beside you. Is it you? Or perhaps you? This planet is like a giant bomb. See how easily it blows itself to bits with a single nuclear warhead. Or rather, <laughs> there he is. It's the enemy. Oh. Oh. Who's shooting? Who's shooting? The bastard shot him. <laughs> Stop! Cease fire! Make it stop, Gene! If you want them to stop, then why not stop them yourself, Snake? Metal Gear is ready to launch. I have no further need of this plant. So you kill your own men? I don't have to kill anyone. These men are quite capable of doing it themselves. I love Snake in this part, and for a reason they'll be discussed in a moment. In the climax, she tries to stop Gene, but he murders her. And she uses her ESP to predict that Snake will destroy this Metal Gear, but he'll build a new Metal Gear in its place, and he'll have sons that save the world and destroy it at the same time, and this is pretty cliche. We do learn that Naked Snake can't have kids, which is neat, I suppose, but what does this add to the larger story of Portable Ops? Not much, to be honest. The only purpose it serves is fan service, but fans already know these things happen later in the continuity, and newcomers don't know what any of this is supposed to mean, and so it really adds nothing to the plot. 
all in all a really worthless scene. It's dramatic, and for that reason I understand why people get invested in this death scene since Elisa was a likable character, but it didn't leave much of an impact on me. The only other characters I need to talk about are the following, Noel, Jean, and Cunningham. Noel is the perfect soldier project I talked about earlier. He feels no fear, no pain, as he mercilessly kills his targets. His memory is wiped in between missions, which takes a long time, and as a result, Fox can't rely on him all the time. But he's a useful asset for them nonetheless. He has no problem killing until he comes across Big Boss, who defeats him, which sends him into a rebellious rampage. That actually is a major element in Portable Ops. The idea that Big Boss is kind of unstoppable. Not in a Sonic Forces way, but more like his sheer skill and determination is something that should be feared if used for evil. One of the bosses, Python, was once a friend of Snake, but now he has a condition comparable to Mr. Freeze where he needs to be in sub-zero temperatures. He's now being used as an anti-Snake defense for the government, but Snake defeats him. Noel is the perfect soldier, but Snake beats him twice. Gene and Cunningham should have the power to defeat Snake, but they can't do it either. Needless to say, it would be a shame if this guy had some bad feelings for the USA at some point. By the end, Noel is revealed to be Frank Yeager. Yes, a young Gray Fox. This being the story of how he came to work with Big Boss. They had seen each other before this, but Big Boss feels sympathy for him given the experiments and psychological damage that's been done to him and decides to save him. I had no problem buying the connection between Gray Fox and Big Boss before this point, but it creates a believable backstory to that, and what more could you want? How about Gene? Well, he's a great villain. Where to begin? Gene believes in the same philosophy as the boss. However, Gene is using his belief that soldiers shouldn't have their loyalties and allegiances decided by politics but by their own will, but he uses this ideal as well as his strong psychic power to bring all these men to his side and create his own nation, all the while threatening superpowers of annihilation from Metal Gear. I talked about the great scene where he gets all Snake's men to kill each other, but he has other moments that stand out as well. In the climax, Ursula resists Gene, but he speeds up to her and stabs her, walking away. We see Noel literally tear men limb from limb with one sword strike, and he also dodges all of our regular bullets. But Gene can outmaneuver Noel, plant like five knives in his leg in the blink of an eye. So not only is Gene a manipulative villain with a logical message, but he has extreme methods and is one of the most powerful Metal Gear villains on a physical level? Yeah, Gene's one of my favorite Metal Gear villains, with another reason coming up soon. But before talking about that, can't forget Cunningham. I do like his voice, but his character doesn't get too much done in this game. I like how merciless he is when asking Snake about the Philosopher's legacy. Anyway, now that we're both here, we can get on with the questioning. The legacy! Where is it? I know you stole the KGB's half. Now tell me where it is! The KGB? What are you talking about? Still playing at denial. Have it your way. Your men die by my hand one by one until you change your mind. Stop! Where's the Philosopher's Legacy? Where is it? I don't know! And I can't get enough of the cutscene with Snake on the elevator on the way to Jean. Here is when the usual Metal Gear plot twist happens. Snake has spent this whole game bonding with his troops in an attempt to stop Jean from harming the Russian motherland. Well, we now have Cunningham revealing that he's not a rogue member of Fox at all. After he lost his leg in a mission from the CIA, he was quickly cast into a desk job. After this, he also learned about the true nation of Operation Snake Eater, which made him despise the CIA for their underhanded tactics. The Department of Defense approached him with a way to get back at the CIA. The CIA had planned Gene's rebellion without him even knowing it. They wanted Gene to fire the nuke at Russia so they wouldn't have to do it themselves. To ensure that Gene would be pressured into doing it, they had Snake captured and led to believe that he was responsible for this and had to prove his innocence by stopping Gene. Really though, Snake's mission was to destroy Raja, provoking Gene into firing the real Metal Gear. Now that Snake is about to stop Gene, Cunningham has revealed this fact and tells Snake that a helicopter is waiting for him to get out of here. This will be his chance to get revenge on the CIA as well after the death of the boss. So that's right, Naked Snake has been used in a stage play by the government. Again. Only this time, there was more at stake. Big Boss, like I just said, grew an attachment to his unit, trying to defend their land. And when they all died, those were real men he had worked with and befriended, and he will not just walk out on them because the mission from some figurehead says he has to. This is exactly what led to the boss dying her unwavering devotion to the country. Snake takes a stand and believes in himself instead of a flag. Can I just say how awesome that twist is? This is the missing link of Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops. Snake Eater told us how Snake could grow to be disillusioned with the USA, but Portable Ops shows us the first time that Big Boss led a private army, as well as taking a stand for his morals as opposed to dropping them so someone else can benefit. I can't let you use Metal Gear. I'm doing this out of loyalty to myself. I'm not gonna live my life the way the boss did. <laughs> Have it your way. Now you're a real traitor. The best part is, 
Nobody's truly saying that what Big Boss is doing here is technically the right thing to do. In his eyes it is, but the mission was to leave at this point. Some could argue that was the right thing to do. What cannot be forgotten about is the fact that this is the backstory to a villain. Remember that for Peace Walker and Ground Zeroes. Big Boss is turning to the dark side, and that turn starts here when he defies the wishes of the government, which turns out to be a good thing in the end, but still. That leads to the climax, where Gene reveals that he knew the CIA was using him to attack Russia, which is why he personally sent the nukes to strike at the Pentagon in an attempt to destroy them and the Philosophers once and for all, thus cementing the fact that Gene must be stopped at all costs. To which Snake does, but upon defeat, Gene gives Snake a microfilm. This microfilm is the cash that Gene had to make Armies Heaven, which explains where Snake himself could establish the funds for Outer Heaven in 25 years. In the end, the nuke is stopped, the soldiers return home, and Big Boss is congratulated yet again with Fox being taken down, in its place, a new special forces group called Foxhound. After the credits, we get another revelation. Ocelot arrives with the director of the CIA and murders him, taking their half of the Philosopher's legacy, thus betraying them. In MGS2, we were told that the Patriots had been around for well over a hundred years given the after credits scene. What's going on around here? I don't know. Anyway, where are they? Well, we were right about them being on Manhattan, but... But what? They're already dead. All twelve of them. When did it happen? Well, uh, about a hundred years ago. What the hell? MGS3 established that the Philosophers had been around since the beginning of the century, around World War I. The dates that MGS2 takes place in, the time the Philosophers were created, and the disc that Otacon got in MGS2 all lead to the conclusion that the Philosophers and the Patriots are one and the same. Over the phone, Ocelot is heard talking to someone and we find out that Major Zero knew about it all and he's planning on using this newly acquired half of the Philosopher's legacy to build a new group that achieves the boss's dream and replaces the Philosopher's now that they're basically done for. Ocelot demands that this group must have Big Boss involved if he's going to consider it, thus implying that these characters are responsible for the Patriots, which is only implication in this game. This will be the crux of the plot in MGS4, so we can save it for that review, whenever I get to it, that is. That's basically it for the story of Portable Ops. It's pretty basic in comparison to the first three solid games and even Metal Gear 2, but that's to be expected given the portable setup. As for what we did get, I think it's quite good. Many emotional moments that worked really well, relevations that continue to expand the timeline lore, but some dumb fan service like the flash forward or the fact that Sokolov was the one who designed Raja. I thought he died in MGS3, but I guess not. Either way, it doesn't really add anything to the story, so his inclusion is not really necessary. Also, for some reason, it's treated like some kind of big reveal that Big Boss finds out that the events of MGS3 was set up by the CIA, which makes no sense. Eva talked to Snake via the recording and revealed the whole thing. From here, you can basically play the things I said about the ending and why it worked again, since this plot twist is just there. To be fair, Gene suggests that one person in particular did it, which Peace Walker believes is the case as well, but that story sucks. Lastly would be the political talk, and I don't have much to say here. In my MGS3 review, I talked about how much was gained via the 60s setting, in terms of politics and pop culture. You won't find much of that here. Richard Nixon is not mentioned, putting the question I raised in the MGS3 review to rest, but they did mention America being in the Vietnam War, and they also talked about the Bay of Pigs invasion, but beyond that, nothing in Portable Lobs really screams 1970 to me. It takes place in 1970 because MGS3 took place in 1964, and the timeline after the credits told us that Fox was created in 1970, so here we are. But what we really should be thinking about is whether or not Portable Ops is canon. You probably don't want to know how much furious debate there is over the subject, but I'll answer it right now. Yes. I really don't know why this game gets thrown under the bus when it comes to the story. I found it to be really engaging with a threatening villain, a great plot twist, fantastic character moments, and the list goes on. Like I said at the beginning, this game was promoted as the game that, sure, was not directed by Kojima himself, but was done in capable hands as they delivered a game that would bridge the gap in between MGS3 and the games that came out prior to it, as well as making setups for events that would take place in the game Kojima was working on, MGS4. Hell, Portable Ops was even shown in MGS4. At that point, this was just as valid to the lore as MGS 2 and 3. This game started to be cast aside once Peace Walker came out. Here's the main issue. Kojima has now said that the key events of Portable Ops happened, but it's not worthy of being in the Metal Gear Saga because there are certain contradictions in it. And I'm like, hello, this is Metal Gear Solid! The franchise where every new game is some giant retcon whether it be good or bad. No joke, the idea that Outer Heaven had women and children in it was added to the lore in Metal Gear 2. The idea that Solid Snake was told he was the son of Big Boss in the climax of Metal Gear 2 and that he was a clone of Big Boss and had clone brothers was added in MGS1. The idea that the politics and events behind the USA for over a hundred years was added to the lore in Metal Gear Solid 2. 
and the idea that Big Boss had a super tragic backstory with any redeeming characteristics was added to the lore in MGS3. Don't even get me started on the games that came out after Portable Ops. Peace Walker even makes fun of this game. Finally, we can leave all that crap in San Geronimo behind. When this story is eons better than that trash. Some have even said that Portable Ops cannot be canon because Gene gives Snake the microfilm to carry on the legacy of Army's Heaven, but at the beginning of Peace Walker, the MSF administration has anything but money on its side. So I'll ask, how is that a flaw with the writing of Portable Ops? It's not the fault of this scam that a sequel pretended it never happened, all the while taking place after it. I find that kind of writing to be shameful, but this is not a review of Peace Walker. Point is, complaining about this would be like putting the blame on Sly 3's ending for the old itch coming back in Sly 4. In Dual Destinies, they make no reference to the new Juris system that was established in Turnabout Succession from Apollo Justice. So should we ban at Apollo? No, we should put blame on the ones making the contradictions. That should be common sense. Now this is finally off my chest. Let us move on. The story is mostly told via static cutscenes with text, however on the rare occasion we get these comic book style cutscenes. Think of the motion comics from MGS 1 and 2, only not nearly as terrible. Those were lacking in environment detail, with too many sketch marks in those hideous faces. These are much better, but are still lacking. Most of the time it's fine, however I can think of one too many instances where serious scenes are just kind of funny because of how dumb the faces look at times. With whatever you call this going by the screen. Also, am I the only one who noticed this big boss was inverted during one of the scenes in the climax? Anyway, not much to say here. They look decent and tell the story well. Peace Walker will continue to improve the idea, so moving on. The voice cast does a pretty good job. The usuals like David Hayter, Josh Keaton, and Robin Atkin Downs are here and they do well. New cast members are fairly... typical? By that I mean these are exactly the kind of cast members you'd expect in the lower budget PSP game, seeing as when this game came out, actors like Tara Strong and Steven Bloom were in like everything, including this. But there aren't many cutscenes, so there's not much to say in regards to the voice cast. Just know that the voice direction is just as high quality as ever. Portable Ops is a PSP game, and as a result, I don't have much to say about the graphics. I could tell you that the resolution of the PSP and the pixelated look and the dithering, but who has time for that? In all seriousness, most of the environments and characters feel like they're ripped right out of Snake Eater with a fresh coat of paint, which is noticeable since new models like Cunningham or Campbell don't look nearly as good. But what does feel very fresh is the soundtrack of Portable Ops. This is some exquisite composition right here, and it doesn't sound very compressed with pieces fitting the atmosphere to a T. The final boss with Gene being one of the highlights for me. Some of it doesn't even sound like Metal Gear music, and I like that quite a bit, with the main theme calling to the night being this game's Snake Eater, and while I do love it, it never really grew attached to it like most people. But that doesn't change just how high quality the lyrics, the singing, and the composition are.
So how about the gameplay? Well, I've reached that moment where I realized that I spent a half hour talking about the non-gameplay elements of Metal Gear Solid Portal Blobs, which is more time than it probably deserves. But let us blast through the gameplay, because Portal Blobs does not do a whole lot when it comes to new ideas. Let's talk about the controls. I already talked about the camera movement earlier, so how about the button layout? Thankfully, this game is a fully customizable button layout, which is awesome. I really don't know why more developers don't do this. Would it really be that much of a troublesome inclusion? I said last time that Portable Ops is a sneak button, and it does, and that's mapped to triangle. Like always, X crouches and sends Snake into crawling mode, but you can also still do the dodge roll, which will send you into crawling mode if you hold on to the button. R1 goes into first person mode and for the first time you can actually move in first person. The movement speed is far too slow for my liking so I don't like using it too much, but it is there if you want to use it. The L1 button will lock onto enemies to make them easier targets, however from my experience this is pretty finicky. Equipping items has always been done with the triggers, but we don't have those on the PSP so this is now done with the circle button, with square attacking. I always swap these two since the melee has always been done with the circle button in the previous games, with square not being too bad when it comes to switching items. When playing on the 360 controller, I'm apt sneaking to the left trigger, equipping to the right trigger, and the D-pad to the right analog stick for camera. Other than that, I didn't make many more changes. This control scheme is the definitive Portable Ops playing experience, so how about the mechanics themselves? Well, many things from MGS3 have been ditched. We don't hunt for food, we don't need to change camouflage, we don't need to equip different weapons via menu. Needless to say, the survival viewer was removed, with Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops still having stamina in it, but med kits refill health, and the returning rations refill your stamina. Being caught is also an instant alert, so don't get caught. Yeah, that's about it. When it comes to the basic controls and mechanics, Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops is largely lifted from MGS3. Although CQC has been simplified, this time we can't slit throats, but with a press of a button we can interrogate, and the CQC slam is much more efficient. Move the analog stick left or right and press circle. To trade off, enemies don't go down in one shot from this, which is fine in my book since we have better control, so that's a fine trade off if you ask me. That and you aren't supposed to get caught to begin with, and so the CQC slam shouldn't be a crutch that's dependent upon to not get caught, it should be a last resort in a bind. From memory, the perfect balance was found in MGS4 and 5, so we'll see in those inevitable reviews. The level design in Portable Ops is also pretty well done. For starters, this game does not have the linear structure from MGS3, nor does it have the dungeon design from Metal Gear 1 through Solid 2. You've probably heard someone in another video say that handheld games are generally played in short bursts. There are some exceptions to this, however, for any developer of a handheld game, it's usually a good idea to make sections of gameplay short so that progress can always be made regardless of how much time you have, since some people might only be playing in the car or a quick bus ride. As a result, Portable Ops is a mission-based structure, with Campbell giving your assignment at the beginning of the mission. Missions can range from 30 seconds to 10 minutes. It's not very balanced in this regard. Story-relevant stuff will last longer, but filler shite like causing a diversion will last no time at all. Not to say that this is a problem, but just an observation. Like I said, the level design itself is pretty well done. Nothing in Portable Ops comes close to levels of MGS3, but what makes level design work is the amount of stealth opportunities. We travel through more man-made environments than we did in MGS3, so as a result we can hide in lockers, sneak along the walls inside buildings, and so on. The map on the pause menu usually helps you find where things are, but they never tell you how to get there, so that's up to you. You could crawl through the floorboards, sneak along the rooftops, etc. Sometimes they can be a bit too big though. For example, when we're just looking for a piece of paper, having a whole town's worth of buildings is a bit excessive, don't you think? The level design is also pretty good for providing you with the items you need, like how a stack of TNT can be found when needing to blow something up, or how the battle with Raja supplies you with an RPG. They don't do this all the time though, so it's best to come prepared. What do I mean by coming prepared? Well, for the first time in the Metal Gear series, we're dealing with squads and soldier recruits. Yes, the gameplay that was so beloved in MGS5 got its roots here in Portable Ops. But since this was the first attempt, there are some flaws. To make sure you won't just use Snake the whole time, the developers gave each soldier, including Snake, 4 item slots. You can bring up to 3 extra soldiers with you, creating 16 item slots. So you can bring the proper amount of explosives, lethal and non-lethal weapons, med kits, and rations. When coming across an item or a weapon when your item slots are full, this means you can't collect it, which is just lame. I think they should have made it so that these weapons are automatically sent back to the base for later use. I also hate how you can send spies out and they'll tell you where useful items are, but they don't just get them for you, which I thought was the point of a spy unit, you have to go get them yourself, when it should have been that you send more spies in one location to get more items out of that location. Anywho, I think that 4 item slots is a bit needless to be honest. Different soldiers have different stats, and that alone would have been a good enough reason to use them. 
For example, Johnny can carry guards faster and you're really gonna want this in this game. Some soldiers can interrogate with CQC while others can't, and also some other soldiers can be used for camouflage which replaces the MGS3 system. And since Snake does not fit in with the environment in this game, it's best to use this feature. All in all, I don't mind the process of giving soldiers their units and assignments. It's a good system that rewards devoted playing time. Like how if you recruit more people to the medical or technical teams, then you can build more weapons and healing items, giving yourself more resources to pick from in between missions. The real source of contention for portable ops that is absolutely the biggest problem with this game is recruiting soldiers. I'm not saying they needed to have a full-on Fulton extraction system, since that conflicts with the low budget that Big Boss and company are working with but some streamlining really could have been done to optimize this to make it worth doing. My least favorite parts of Portable Ops are those where you can't progress until you get more people for the spy unit and assign them to locations so that you can get intel to progress with a real mission. That's always my least favorite part because to recruit one soldier you must find someone, and then the game tells you to find out if they're skeptical of Gene, but that doesn't actually mean much since you can recruit anyone, knock them out, drag their unconscious body back to the truck, which is usually pretty far removed from where the enemies are, and it helps to play as someone who can do this faster, but still, it's just so tedious to have to walk around at half speed while being incapable of defending yourself as you bring them back to the truck. If MGS5 did this, it wouldn't have been a big deal because movement speed is acceptable and you're permitted to use a single-handed weapon here. I never enjoyed carrying bodies into lockers in MGS2 and 3, and so there's no way it can be any fun to do this to expand your numbers in portable ops. The rewards are great for growing your staff like I mentioned already, but what is that worth when doing so is some of the most tedious gameplay we've done in the series up to this point. Find a guy, drag him back, find another, drag him back, it takes forever. There should have been an alternative here. Like once your combat unit grows a bit, you can call a number and have them pick a soldier up when you leave them unconscious. The game does try to do this, but for this code to work, you still have to drag the body over to the hiding spot where your fellow squad members are. Which, by the way, is usually only 5 seconds away from the truck. Why couldn't you just choose where your squad will be hiding? Leaving convenient spots to recruit soldiers all across the map, which would make the experience feel more tactical. Also, why is it that the stats are different for every soldier, but you can't learn what these stats are until you've recruited them? It doesn't make a huge difference since the final results will usually be the same, but still, that's another kink to iron out for the next game to use the mission-based setup. Does all this ruin the game though. I don't think so. I personally believe that the recruitment process has been used as yet another rationalization for throwing this game into the garbage. In regards to base development, I played Portable Ops as minimally as possible and got through just fine. Never needed to farm for soldiers to make the game more playable since it's quite doable when you aren't going out of your way for soldiers. I only had to when I needed spies and even then I only grabbed like one or two and called it a day. The mechanics in Portable Ops, the level design, and the story were so fantastic, so... I don't see what the issue is there, but I'll get back to that in the conclusion, which leaves us with the last thing for the gameplay, the bosses. I really can't get enough of these battles. None of them are truly innovative like the battles of MGS2 and 3, and some of them are more or less just shooting matches like Cunningham, but the ones I love would be Python and the two battles with Null. Both are excellent since the whole time you really feel like you're being hunted, with the battle with Python stripping your vision away so you need to rely on your senses and wits to outmatch him. You can use thermal goggles to help out, however this doesn't just save you since firing blindly will cause him to shoot your weapon making it unusable for a few moments. But the definition of good timing and predator skills are the Null bosses. You can't use CQ see since he's so good at it himself, so you need to lure him around and find a good time to strike. The whole time you can just hear his footsteps coming after you and it creates a genuinely scary atmosphere when being caught since he kills you in no time, making victories all the more satisfying. And lastly, I like how the battle with Gene utilizes his ability to play with people's minds as he says the final words of the boss, but still, it's a simple fight with a few patterns to learn as you overcome Gene, thus ending the game, leading us to the conclusion. Looking at this game critically, yes, it's flawed, but on the whole, this video was titled A Critical Defense because yes, it has flaws and so I'm going to point them out, but this game is still really good. In the three or four playthroughs I've done of Portable Ops, I have yet to feel like I wasn't having a good time, wasn't being given satisfying challenges to overcome. The boss fights were great, the voice acting was pretty good, the soundtrack was fantastic, the mechanics themselves are just as good as MGS2 and 3 with simplified CQC, a plethora of customization and variety, and a story that keeps you invested. How can I say that Sokolov being the maker of Raja, or a flash forward that adds nothing, and the recruitment process make Portable Ops a bad game? 
It's a very solid time all around. In my opinion, it just doesn't deserve to be treated the way it is. You can dislike it all you want, that's fine. I just can't see how it's fair to say that this game isn't canon or any of that crap since despite having Eva and Ocelot as optional recruits which doesn't work with the lore, it has a main story that sheds light on Big Boss's first turn against the government, the recovery of the other half of the legacy, the end of the Philosophers, the first Metal Gear, the end of the Fox unit, the birth of Foxhound, and most importantly, the origins of the Patriots. So that's a pretty long list of important events for such a throwaway game, don't you think? The gameplay itself has some bugs to iron out, but after over 100 hours of MGS5, I have to point out how interesting it was to go back to Portable Ops and see how that gameplay style got its origins, and it was not in Peace Walker, it was here in Portable Ops. Needless to say, I can see myself playing this many times over in the future. However, like I said last time, it's not as good as Snake Eater. In fact, Portable Ops is the weakest Metal Gear game I've reviewed yet. Yes, I did enjoy Metal Gear 1 more. While the issues of Portable Ops aren't killing factors for me, they are there, and it's a game you'd have to go out of your way to play in 2017, so... Yes, weakest game yet, but it's still incredibly awesome. Whether you're playing it on PSP, PS Vita, or PS TV, it knew what it was going to be, and so the game doesn't try to be better than the other games, and MGS3 especially. It's the sequel to MGS3, but it doesn't pretend to be an experience that trumps it, just one that takes place after it. With all that said and done, I think I've said just about everything I needed to say about Portable Ops, this being the final Metal Gear video on the channel in 2017. We've covered quite a bit of ground, starting with MGS1 and the Twin Snakes, MGS2 and MGS3, and now Portable Ops. There will be three more reviews in 2017, but Metal Gear won't be the focus for those videos. Next year we'll be covering the last four games of this retrospective though, Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots, Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker, Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes, and finally Metal Gear Solid 5 The Phantom Pain. I hope you all enjoyed watching, and I'll see you next time.